Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report and uh, Clay and Iron Show. And, of course, uh, lots of issues happening over the weekend. I had an interesting discussion today with Holly Dale, and, of course, her husband, Stan Dale, is probably one of the most brilliant uh, scientists dealing with many earth change issues. We also have, uh, going to be getting on the line in just a moment, Professor James McCanny. Professor McCanny, of course, uh, his explanation and research into the plasma universe, the idea that uh, comets and asteroids are charged bodies, and that many of the interactions that trigger off uh, coronal mass ejections are geomagnetic effects, etc., uh, changes in the ozone layer uh, and the magnetosphere of the Earth and other planets can be expected to be affected by plasma activity. And uh, the latest, uh, Professor James McKinney, uh we have a bunch of things going on. One of the interesting discussions we had before the show today was uh, looking at anomalies. Now, we can have anomalous storms. Back in uh, over a century ago, there were some strange storms that struck the, the United States. But this particular storm called the Frankenstorm that occurs right around Halloween that could sit right over the northeast United States over as long as maybe up to a week uh, appears to be the convergence of four or five storms. Uh, this is very anomalous. In fact, the storm surge is thought to, that it may hit New York City as high as 11 feet. And I think that their storm walls are only able to handle up to 5 feet. So it's very possible that the MTA, the Metro Tran- Transit Authority, will have major flooding. And there's going to be a lot of destruction. They're going to call it the billion-dollar storm because it's going to cause damage in the billions. Plus, it will also reduce voter turnout. Uh, these anomalies uh, beg the question, is it one that's natural or is it one that's being tweaked? Uh, is there any ideas in that area? Oh, hello, uh, Bill. Yeah, they, I absolutely think there's something strange going on here. Uh, you might remember in 1991, the, what they call the perfect storm, there were three hurricanes that eventually joined in the North Atlantic, uh, but those were over land storms, and one of those storms came through the Midwest on Halloween. 1991, right. and it, it dropped three feet of snow one day, and when the backside of the hurricane, I call it hurricane, it dumped another three feet uh, the next day. Uh, but at any rate, this storm that we're dealing with now looks a little bit too strange to me. Uh, the thing I look at is there's really, we don't have the solar conditions to drive a storm like this. Yeah, in other words, you don't have a, we don't have a lot of sunspot activity because you have to heat the surface of the ocean to get amount of moisture and energy to generate this, which means uh, there's several ways that I know of that are classified in order to convert a storm. One is to create a time-dependent vortex, basically uh, waves in the upper atmosphere using HARP technology. The other is just to use superheated uh, uh, plasma using space-based lasers. Uh, and you probably know of other techniques that are used for weather modification that can use energetic technologies. Uh, this obviously has geopolitical consequences because a low voter turnout is going to be in favor of the Republicans and it has always been that case. And, and, and could well tilt the vote toward Romney uh, during this election. Yeah, that's, that's one issue, and it it could be kind of a signaling that almost that elections don't count, that the lives of people are being uh, dominated by other factors, and you know it almost it almost gives me that kind of uh, feeling that people are helpless. Uh, we've seen for at least a decade now natural events that look like natural events but really have been man-made. And I would classify, for example, the tsunami in Japan uh, and the destruction of the, the Fukushima reactor as a, uh, apparently was a result, but it, there's a lot of evidence that the Fukushima reactor was actually blown up, kind of a 9-11 type of explosion situation at the reactor, and that the, the uh, tsunami itself was man-made that the earthquake was not sufficient to drive that tsunami. So anyway, what we're seeing is what appear to be natural uh, acts of God, so to speak, but are really man-made to control, to manipulate, to move geopolitical scenes on on a grand scale. We saw Hurricane Katrina. They were already, they already knew Hurricane Katrina was going to New Orleans when it was still in the Atlantic Ocean. People were betting oil futures that had inside information when when that storm was still in the Atlantic. How do you do that? 
Well, the, the answer is that these are manipulated. They're geo, I, w- I would call them social, political social uh, maneuvering to maneuver the, uh, the large sections of population. And I, I believe that that's what we're seeing here. Yeah, exactly. Now, if we go back and look at the science, in the 1960s, the, home, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was being manipulated by U.S. weather using bombing with silver iodide particles uh, to create massive, uh, you know, s- uh, rainstorms that would destroy the normal area. Of course, they didn't understand that underneath the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they'd actually tunneled hundreds of miles of tunneling that was designed to actually allow them to move about the jungle, even after they're deforested with... Uh, uh, defoliating agents like uh, napalm uh, and the superstorms that they were creating over them, so they they were still the Viet Cong were able to move underneath the uh, the forest floor by tunneling. Yeah, uh, the the situation in New York right now, uh, I, I've seen some of the footage that's come back so far, and it's it's going to be very bad. There's going to be a, a tremendous amount of destruction. And I just got a thing, an uh, uh, indication here right before the show. I got an email from somebody said that there are already class action suits being started uh, with people suing the government for damage that, uh, with the concept that these are manipulated storms. Well, and that, yeah. uh, the way, the way that they can tell, and this, I'm just going to use my um, imagination to see if these ideas are, may have some way of it being imaged, but if you're going to create a storm, a storm vortex, you have to do it between about probably sixty to 80,000 feet. You have to either create a uh, time-dependent plasma field up in the upper atmosphere. So you should be able to see it with infrared imaging technology. Uh, and then if you're looking at it from space, you should be able to have some kind of uh, space-based, uh, you know, infrared technology to look at the superheated plasma in the upper atmosphere. So my guess is if there's any kind of imaging technology either that conventional citizens have or universities, they should be able to see some anomalies in terms of the atmospheric grid pattern. Uh, we know there were some strange patterns of grid-like activity that occurred before Katrina gathered because it was like a pinwheel of of these converging storms that took up to seven or eight days for them to actually pull in toward the central point before they actually started steering them like a joystick toward uh, Katrina, toward New Orleans. And there appear to be opposing forces pulling it in a different direction, too. So um, is there any, any way of uh, kind of imaging or finding some kind of uh, data stream that would, would be, allow us to kind of test the theory of what they use to manipulate the storm? Uh, on my web page, I've got a, a storm that I measured. It was about 10 years ago, and I was up in an airplane, and I was able to measure the, the pulsing of the laser, and what it does is it ionizes the air. Right. Uh, as, and this was in a storm in the Pacific at the time. It was a storm that was coming up the west uh, coast of the U.S., and so anyway, with that, I was able to verify, and it wasn't a damaging storm, it was just a very unusual storm that rode up the west coast of the United States about 100 miles offshore. But what I was able to do was to verify that that storm was being manipulated and to verify the technique that they were using, which was a laser satellite. And so uh, that I have on my homepage, and, and that was just a practice run, at the one that I actually measured. But uh, I don't have the ability to go out in the Atlantic right now and uh, go after this one. But, uh, you know, what was it, about 15 years ago, Russia came to the U.N. and they said that they wanted an international ban on weather manipulation used as warfare. And the U.S. agreed to it, and it but it was a very strange uh, wording that the U.S. agreed to it, but they would not agree that a country couldn't do it to its own population. Yeah, I, I know that those those dialogues had happened. They were actually documented, aren't they? Yeah, but they, they wouldn't agree to not do it to their own population. Yeah, well, we know that they did with Katrina. There's no doubt about that. Back in a moment with Professor James McCanney. Welcome back, and um, Dr. McKenna, you mentioned, Professor McKenna, you mentioned a very important point that these storms are not going to be over like in a day or two, maybe not even in weeks. 
uh, the destruction and the destruction of infrastructure like the MTA, the Metro Transit Authority, and the subway systems in New York City, it's very possible that you could have something like the stock market not just put to, uh, on hold today, but literally for weeks. We could have a level of destruction that could be really disturbing, plus the station blackout. In fact, I got a report today from Chris Harris that the uh, emergency diesels at the Oyster Creek uh, and uh, area uh, is is at grade elevation, face a possibility of being flooded by the neighboring creek. Uh, and there's a diesel generator of the northeast of the plant as well. Uh, there's another area, of course, that are a direct line of these, such as the... Uh, Indian Point. Uh, Chris, you, you mentioned on the uh, email you sent me today that there's some dangers there of Oyster Creek diesels, which are a great elevation. This is supposed to be an 11-foot surge, according to the latest weather reports. Uh, the uh, governor of the state of New York has basically tried to warn people, don't underestimate the storm. The level of surge is greater than they've ever seen for any predicted storm in U.S. history hitting New York City. Uh, this looks like a convergence of at least four or five storms, and as Dr. Mc Professor McCanny says, there isn't enough solar energy to explain this unless you know it's a manipulated storm, so there's already lawsuits against the government for manipulated weather. Uh, what are the plants and what's the stances uh, of a station blackout and a major loss of power causing a loss of containment and a nuclear explosion or release of radiation like Fukushima occurring in the northeast United States because of the Frankenstorm. Oh, hello, uh, Dr. Bill? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Professor McCanny is here as well. Professor McCanny, I'm a big fan of yours, sir. Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, we were, I just sent you a report this morning about uh, uh, Oyster Creek. and I, You know, I, I could go ahead and try to analyze every single plant that's in the path of this, but Oyster Creek seems to be going to be taking the brunt of this. So what uh, I did was I pulled out their maximum um, expected flood levels and where they're in grade. They never expect anything above 22 feet above uh, mean sea level. And that is all based on, as I said before, a um, 1962 historic storm. That's how things are done. They go ahead and they say, what's the worst possible case? And so 1962, they said this couldn't possibly be any worse. It looks like this is going to already be worse. So I went and dug out uh, some drawings of the site property, and it looks like the diesel generators. I think you've seen that uh, picture. It's yeah. pretty close. It's pretty close to uh, one of their water outtake structures, which would which would have to that that would flood. Um, I've been at that site, and there isn't really any berm there. It's just basically. Um, a canal with some good sloping sides, but uh, if if it goes up there, well, you know that plant. That's the one I would look at right now. If I'm going to say in jeopardy, Millstone also is not out of the woodwork, uh, out of the woods either. And um, so, uh, what could happen? Yeah, you could have a flooding event and a loss of offsite power. That's and that's what I'm saying. Now, the loss of offsite power could be imminent because uh, that part of New Jersey is getting uh, is getting pummeled right now. And well, what's the hard. proximity? What's the proximity in terms of location physically to either major transport, uh, railway, uh, city populations for the Oyster Creek um, facility? What, what's the relative Oyster distance? Oyster Creek is, in, is, on, is pretty close to the shore. There's nothing but a thin barrier island separating it from the Atlantic Ocean and Barnegat Bay, which is really where, where it is. It's actually a little town called Forked River, New Jersey. There are, it's pretty popular. I mean, it's a suburban, it's a suburban setting. Now you're not you're all the way on the other side of you're, you're closer to Atlantic City than you are to here. I believe my geography is correct. It took a while to get there from here, but then again, it's a it's a lot of small roads usually getting there. Uh, it's on the east coast. I think your your Atlantic City is close to that, but then again, you're also it's a nuclear kind of thing. You're also pretty close to Washington D.C., Wilmington, Delaware, um, Baltimore, even New York and uh, Philadelphia. You know, well, you know, what is the long, what is the long-term effect of power outage in the area? Could it be weeks? That, that all depends on the damage. I mean, you know, that I, I can't say that. I don't know the answer to that question. Sometimes it's just a a quick a quick uh, blip, and sometimes uh, if there's a lot of damage in power lines, like we saw in the uh, those. That big tornado storm we saw back in April, uh, over a year ago, 
uh, um, uh, that took out Tennessee Valley Authority's big high lines, that, that deadly line of tour tornadoes, uh, that took them a very long time before they were off the diesel generators, before they were weaned off the diesel generators. It took them over a week before they could get uh, full power back from off-site. I, I don't have the exact, uh, you know, um, the exact data of how long it took, but it, it was a, it, they were on the deals for a very long time. Right. Um, what what we're, we're, we're trying to imagine here, too, is the effect on the election, which is coming up in, in the near future here. Uh, and the ability of people to recover to the point where they can actually function to the point where they can go vote normally. Uh, and so anyway, I'm just, uh, uh, that's one thing we're, I'm sure we're going to be following here in the next uh, week, right, Bill? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, I think that there's, um, you know, obviously this, this looks like a manipulated storm. There also is a grave danger. What about uh, the area of... Uh, that large plant that's really near New York City as well. What's it called? Uh, Indian Point. Indian Point. Yeah. Is that that's near a very dangerous area? It's very near the populations of New Jersey, New York. Is that likely to be uh, a swamped as well with this storm surge? It would have to back up the Hudson River quite a ways. I'm not saying it can't it can't happen, but you know, I focused my attention on the one or two that I had at my fingertips and, you know, fresh in my mind. Indian Point does have, I mean, it, it's pretty close to the river level, and I've been there with some with some high river water, and, and but it's, I, I, like I said, I, I think, I didn't waste your part of it. I to say, which ones would you be worried about? I'd be worried about Oyster Creek and Millstone and even Calvert Cliffs right now. Um, remember, you're also got you're more than you more than just uh, uh, flood. You also have high winds. And if you remember in, the, in Irene, Calvert Cliffs thought it was going to get out uh, unscathed when a piece of the building actually tore off the side, turned into a, a, a kite. It was a big sheet steel uh, affair, and it went right into the transform and gave it a, a, a loss of offsite power, just like that. They did it to themselves. So there's like anything that could happen when you have all of this uh, natural uh, calamity going on, or unnatural, if we, th we, we think that way. And um, so it's certainly, you know, remember I said, you know, uh, you line up the wickets as far as, um, you know, so let's say uh, Fukushima is the worst case you can get. You know, you start lining up wickets. That's when I start getting interested in the, in the whole thing. I'm... Right, and what I'd like you to do is kind of research it some more, and if necessary, pop back on either today or tomorrow, because I think in the next few days, if this storm does what I expected to do, we're going to have an American Fukushima. Quite possible. If I have yeah. electrical power, my, 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 uh, my, uh, my goal is to keep my family safe, and if I'm not available, then somewhere down the future, I will be available. Absolutely. Uh, keep, keep in touch. We'll be back in a moment with Professor McKinney. Open the lines as well, 800-259-5791. I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. There was something so pleasant about that place. Welcome back, and... Um, had an interesting comment. I just wanted to diverge for a second here. We have Professor McCanny. It's open lines on any health issue or any geopolitical. This is a really big issue. If we have a station blackout, we could have an American Fukushima like Oyster Creek or the Indian Point plant. We also have uh, a vote, lower voter turnout always tends to favor Republicans. So you wonder who behind the scenes, even if it's not known by Romney, uh, is manipulating this toward a, an election where Obama is being broomed out of position. Um, I saw an interesting email that was sent to me over the weekend that uh, Obama's wife, Michelle, has already bought a house in Hawaii, so maybe they already know they're on their way. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's uh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> another comment, by the way, one of the uh, docs that, uh, called, that listens to the program regularly made a comment that uh, human chorionic and anatropin is off-label used to increase testosterone in males, especially if they have undescended testes. And... Uh, because it, it, uh, it simulates uh, LH or luteinizing hormone, that's quarter of an off-label use. 
it's uh, you'd have to actually prove by measuring free levels of the male hormones testosterone, endostine, dione, and dihydrotestosterone, and also make certain that you're not getting an increase in the level of sex hormone binding globulin, which you can measure. Um, uh, you know, if people measure that, they can say yes, it's going to increase testosterone levels, both males and females. In females, it's going to increase sex drive. In males, it may help if undescended testicles are present or if people are getting andropause. So HCG, though, you have to give very much higher dosages than you'd give ordinarily for just weight loss, for induction of peripheral thyroid hormone conversion. So uh, I'm going to be pulling up a bunch of literature on that from PubMed. I have some other articles here. Most of the people that are saying this uh, are talking about off-label uses. In other words, uh, HCG off-label, and I have some articles that I'm going to post up here. Uh, so they say it simulates or closely resembles luteinizing hormones. So... The fact is, until you do the actual testing, uh, and they're not talking about the drops, which is under the tongue. They're talking about injections in fairly large dosages. The thing about HCG, and you have to understand it, is an, uh, it's, a, it's a TRH analog. Ordinarily, your body's going to release TRH from your jejunum and your pancreas, and it does it after you take something as simple as Berberstatin. You don't need to go to buy something like a Barris, which is really expensive. It's about $300 plus a month. Uh, to take a virus, which is the actual 5 milligram TRH you take under the tongue, uh, a Berberstatin, two capsules twice a day, which is very affordable, not only cleans the upper small bowel of pathogens, but helps your body release TRH, which is an LH analog. So uh, if you want to release a luteinizing hormone analog that's actually coming from your bowel to restore normal hormone level, you do it from uh, taking Berberstatin. So I'll post all the literature on this. So I don't think it's the primary way you want to restore male hormones. You want to use uh, men's max, which is going to release some bound hormones. You want to take uh, enhanced for men will increase your output, and you take berberstatin to release TRH. You would not be taking injectable, very high dose HCG, which is much higher than the dosages recommended for people trying to lose weight. So uh, that question came up, um, Professor McKinney. We, we have the government shutting down during the Obama administration science. We talked about this the other day, Tier 1 and Tier 2 science. What we see is a, that wall between Tier 1 and 2 science and the public, which are highly informed now because of the Internet, and many of them very intelligent, many of them have advanced training or have researched you know, what we call citizen scientists. Uh, it's very distressing to have issues like extreme weather like this when anybody with two clues can say, this doesn't look normal. And then they start seeing there's less sunspot activity, so you couldn't see all these storms converging into one superstorm, the Frankenstorm. Uh, it seems all too convenient to happen at this particular time. Um, what, what's your general comment about this? Because we have nearest objects, we've got uh, the changes in the uh, galactic and solar system, we've got the approach of large comets coming in the next year. In the next two years, we're going to have an increase in solar max activity. Uh, the science is literally being withheld from the public, putting us in danger. Um, you know, this storm is a perfect example. How many people are aware that we could have get a station blackout in American Fukushima occurring in the northeast United States caused by the fact that they could lose power for many days and not be able to get diesel fuel back in there to keep these plants from going critical? Well, it, it's at a time, too, if we look, uh, they're heading into winter. Uh, there could be other damage here to the point where it's going to simply disrupt, and, and that's the term I want to use. Uh, if you uh, if you want to disrupt society, let's put it that way, this storm will do that. Uh, and that's why I was asking just a little earlier, what is going to be the long-term effect of, say, electrical outage? And then we have the added factor that, and I've seen this over the past year, were natural events, that storm that hit Washington, for example, uh, what was like earlier in the spring, and they had the, the power out for two weeks in Washington, and there was no need for the power to be out for two weeks. So could this be used as, a, as an excuse to keep power out or keep dropping it, saying, oh, well, the power's dropping and it was due to the storm. Keep using this as an excuse, uh, just like the Taliban or so other... Yeah, uh, in other words... Have that used. In other words, this could be a, uh, whether it's Obama or Romney, this could be, quote, the October surprise. Yeah, and this is a thing, and this is social, geopolitical, social engineering at its best. Uh, it right. comes right at an election, and so people might 
uh, uh, afterwards argue, well, say Romney wins or something like that, and they say, well, this or is... Or vice versa, Obama. I mean, it could work yeah. either way. We, we, we don't know exactly how... The, you know, I'm just guessing that uh, in the past, the lower voter turnout tends to favor Republicans. Yeah, but that there, there again, that could be used as an, an excuse, and most people would say argue over that when really the overall uh, goal was geopolitical social engineering, as like we saw in New Orleans. New Orleans is a very different place. It was socially engineered with Katrina. Uh, now we're seeing it in the Northeast, and uh, so what yeah. I see is, is a method of uh, I call it weather bombing. Uh, we were talking about this offline earlier. It's a very effective way to uh, to control and manipulate extreme large populations that only a nuclear bomb could do something like this. I mean, if you took World War II bombing techniques, uh, you could not destroy or socially engineer an area as effectively as using weather. And yeah, in other words, weather, uh, one of the things one of the things is federalizing large cities uh, complexes you know many millions of people and this storm could literally federalize like it has in Katrina and Louisiana federalize a lot of cities up in the northeast right exactly so you're talking you know what 15% uh, of the country uh, that could be the future their future for, will forever be changed the uh, social uh, the way they uh, manage their lives, uh, this could, uh, uh, and this could be the be the beginning of other major social engineering changes. Uh, uh, and this type of thing, where and then it's blamed on a natural disaster. Uh, so how convenient? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now the um, the the interesting thing about this is is its parallel with near Earth objects. There's some reports that I'm hearing that there's some kind of a, a large comet going to be seen in December of this year. Do you have any evidence of that? Because I haven't been able to corroborate this report. It was put out by uh, another researcher. I won't mention his name. But he's saying that there's going to be time with some very large um, geomagnetic events occurring on the planet. Let's put it that way. Well, the, the, the comet that... Uh <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been talking about a C2012 S1, and it's out uh, beyond the orbit of Jupiter right now. And January 15th, we're going to have a, a a pretty good electrical alignment with this comet, and I see some Earth effects at that point. But I don't see any other comets that would be affecting Earth. So I'm not in what you're talking about. Yeah, and that's quite a distance else. away. We're, you're talking about something that basically is is you know somewhere around 55 million miles away plus, right? Um, uh, yeah, the, well, the, the comet right now is probably, I don't even know how far, it's probably about 2 AU away. Wow. Two, uh, two astronomical units, which is two times the distance to the sun. Yeah. So it's somewhere around 180 million miles away, so very unlikely to have any effects in December, so uh, no corroboration. If you have any questions for Professor McKinney on any issue on health or otherwise, 800-259-5791. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. We have a caller, and your na first name and what state you're calling from. Richard, state of Washington. Great. Richard, you had a question for Professor McKinney, a couple statements, and a really important topic. I'm glad you're bringing it up. Uh, please tell what it's about. Yeah, listen to Dr. McCanny's uh, weekly show. Uh, I would I would highlight that, and having uh, watched uh, or listened to his show on a regular basis, he's not yet uh, discussed pole shift or, or not really uh, spent time on it. And I'd really just like to hear his opinion on on magnetic influx uh, influx lowering and how this is going to affect the the upcoming uh, geopolitical perspective. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I know there are people predicting uh, pole shifts in the November, early December time frame. I don't personally have any information on that. Uh, the the one thing that I have to clarify is that uh, my my books uh, clarify the issue of pole shifts. I think it's my weather book. Uh, there are magnetic pole shifts in which there's a change in direction in the Earth-based magnetic field. Uh, and the, the, these are happening actually on a daily basis. We have magnetic reversals that occur when the solar wind changes directions 
the magnetic field and can actually reverse our geomagnetic field. And these happen regularly. And it's in, uh, uh, we get a dose of radiation, but most people don't sense or feel anything other than uh, maybe in Russia they talk about increased uh, general cancer rate statistics uh, and that you shouldn't fly airplanes near the North Pole at those times. Physical pole shifts, and these are the, the big dangerous ones, only occur when some massive object comes by Earth and puts a gravitational wave into the surface, the mantle and crust, and it actually shifts over the viscous layer that's just below it. Um, and that requires some, if, if that happens, we're probably all going to be dead, so uh, or very close to it. And, and those only occur when massive celestial objects come near Earth. So, uh, but the, so, the, so what your point is, Professor McKinney, if we discern this, is a drop in the magnetic flux field, which isn't occurring quickly. The best way for people to measure it is simply look at the UV index or have a magnetometer to measure the Earth's magnetic field and, and its dipole and millitesla. If it's not dropping dramatically, and there's no dec increase in ultraviolet light, even if that occurred, we're not talking about a disjunction between the lithosphere or the crust and the mantle. It only occurs when a large gravitonic object moves past the Earth like a large comet or planetoid or dwarf star and has to be within millions of miles of the Earth's lunar distances so that there's a differential gravity wave that would affect one side of the Earth and the mantle versus the other side so you get a disjunction where maybe it'll start to slide or slip like the skin of a peach after or a tomato after it's been uh, blanched in a, in a steam boiler and the, the skin or the, or the crust would slide ever so slowly over a period of weeks over the mantle. Uh, that could occur, but that's unlikely unless we have an object. We're not going to have it happen because of magnetic fields changing. Uh, there's no evidence of that, is there? Uh, no, and... Uh the, the also just to, to mention there's apparently some people saying there's a massive comet that earth is going to interact with here in the next month and there's no uh, evidence for that we have a comet that's out be, beyond jupiter that we're going to have an electrical interaction with on january 15th i've been talking about that but there's no physical comet that's slated to come by earth in the next month uh that right. i'm aware of uh, so at any rate, uh, uh, I think what happens is uh, there, there's, first of all, confusion between magnetic pole shifts and physical pole shifts. And like I say, the magnetic pole shifts are happening. They're literally happening all the time. Uh, yeah. where the, uh, and that's due to solar wind interactions, other electrical interactions. But uh, the other thing is that um, there's a number of people unfortunately on the internet who don't have any scientific background and uh and, and there's a really a broad range of mixture of this but uh i'm asked all the time to comment on this and 98 percent of the time uh there's there's no factual basis uh if if earth were going to have an encounter of some kind then what, there's some real specific data that has to be presented, and that is dealing with uh, orbits of comets, orbits of large objects, and these people don't present any. There's, they, don't, they simply don't present the kind of data that's necessary, first of all, for a second in, or third independent party to verify it, uh, and, uh, and so it just kind of clogs the field right. with Right. I don't think Stan, listen, I just talked to Holly this morning. I don't think Stan's predicting that that kind of event's going to happen. Now, Marshall Masters has stated that there's some kind of a comet-like object going to occur with major superquakes all over the planet in December and thereafter. No scientific basis. You can go to his website, yowza.com. Uh, the problem is that on this program, not like many other programs or coast-to-coast -coast radio etc we're not going to bring you confusion we're going to bring you hard science we're going to actually analyze the real catastrophes coming are ones that can be quantifiably addressed the thing i'm concerned about is the fact the government's shutting down access to information to tier two scientists and to the public so that we can analyze what's really going on uh, we are seeing a decrease in the magnetic field but at its current rate it'll take a thousand years to reduce to the level that will be dangerous it could speed up for some other effect like a passing high energy plasma object like a comet or, or a red or, or brown dwarf star 
Uh, but we'd see plenty of advance notice on that, even if it's coming in from the southern ecliptic, where only 3% of our telescopes are, are pointed in the direction, and you need infrared uh, X-ray telescopes like the uh, Chandra space-based telescope, the stereoscopic, or the uh, wide-angle WISE telescope that's out in space. The problem is the government's making all the stuff black op, and the discerning part is that we see evidence that there is something coming, but we can't give you any dates. And anybody who suggests it's just because they're saying in their theory it's a magnetic field, nah, it's not the case. And we're putting specific dates. We do know objects are coming by, and this one that you mentioned, Professor McKinney, is likely to have some very major effects on Mars, and major effects on the sun, if it gets into the uh, chromosphere of the sun, we're likely to see a CME as it passes close enough to have a discharge. And if we just happen to be geocentric to that discharge, within 15 degrees uh, of its discharge, we could have some serious uh, CME effects on the planet uh, toward the fall of next year. That's what I think is the thing to be. I'm most concerned about that. I'm wor- more worried about a CME than a pole shift. This pole shift stuff happens when large objects pass by the Earth and then there's a disjunction of the lithosphere and the, and the gel-like mantle. Yeah, and when, when those events happen, those are the major, uh, what would you call, Earth-altering events where, where you have mass extinctions, uh, some of them greater than others. Uh, but uh, the, but we're, we're not, we don't have any of those slated for right now. And, yeah, and unfortunately... If you follow the people that they are making this prediction about a comet in November, December, unfortunately, they do that about every month. That, well, I think I, I, if you ask a question, and I want to ask this question straight up, because I, we don't hear an awful lot of what I call scientifically rigorous honesty in the alternative media. The regular media is useless, okay? But we're we try to be the, the top-level program, along with your program, Professor McCanny, why would people do this? Number one, either they are unscientifically based and they're just uh, egomaniacs and they want to say something. Number two, they're just information ops or COINTELPRO. And they're operating as an arm of the government because they want to make sure that nobody really believes the alternative media when we present really good questions with the limited data we have. Right. I tend to think there's a, I think there's both of them out there. I think there's unqualified people that shouldn't open their mouth. And on the other hand, I think the majority of people that are opening their mouth that are in high positions, a lot of them, uh, when it's something like the every monthly disaster coming, either they're mentally imbalanced or uh, they're COINTELPRO. Because if your disaster keeps on not happening, why would people believe you after a while? And then when real issues uh, start to present themselves, and let's say the ultraviolet light uh, level starts to get really severely high because the magnetic field is dropping, or because we have a plasma effect that affects the sun and we have a big CME with a major solar wind and radiation storm uh, occurring, you know, people aren't going to pay attention when we actually give them a real Am warning. Am I still on the air? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, make a comment. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, ask uh, uh, Dr. McCanny, has he studied uh, Patrick Girl's work on, on alignment in the solar system with, with uh, possible earthquake activity, and secondarily, the Gulf oil non-accident and the change of the, the jet stream? Is that influencing uh, a lot of, of what's happening in, in today's weather picture? Well, the, the Gulf Stream is, it was shut down after the BP oil spill. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm the person who wrote the book on electrical alignments and their effect on Earth. And uh, so I'm, I'm real familiar with that. And that we definitely have to have you time. back, uh, Pro- Professor McKinney, to get and talk about this in terms of planetary alignments, etc., because you're the expert. Thank you. Great questions. Okay. Back in a moment with hour number two, hour three, coming up with Ryan. And, of course, a remarkable program, good questions, great audience. Back in a moment. <laughs> 